It's February. It's Black History yeah. Month. What does that mean to you guys? Excuse me? Black History Month. We need a longer February. month. Black History Month, we, we need like the whole be, year. We, we need a, a Black History month. Year. How about Black History Year yeah. for one year? Yeah. And, and, Out of every two years. Where do you, one year, Black History all Year. All right, all right, all right. Peace, 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 everybody. It is the guy with the bow tie checking in with you live with the family on screen. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Professionally Black 2021, post the last four years of craziness back into reality. How's everybody doing? You come off me and start yelling at me. I see Nick yelling at me already. Let's go. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Good. Yeah, Black there we Black go. Black. Great. Oh man, happy to be it here. It is Black History Month. If you've not paid attention, folks, it is for that one month we get out the year to represent our people. But minute, please represent the comments. It should it's be every month. month. Like Bobby Brown said the best, it should be every month, but we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. Uh, I want to say thank you to hashtag team live, hashtag team replay, however you consume the content. We appreciate it. Please let us know below and where you're watching from. Uh, Professionally Black is a event of love for us to share how we feel. We're talking about the gift of blackness today. And you will see a lot of melanated minds you know and love on LinkedIn right now and on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, let us know. If you're on LinkedIn, let us know. But I want to go around the horn for people that might not know these folks. And please share this, people. If you're watching this, please share it. Um, black voices get, you know, don't get amplified enough on LinkedIn. So this is a chance for us to sort of message. But I'll start to my right on here, but it's my left and I point this way. Wonderful Queen Ramona Houston, let us know who you are and what you do for the world. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to hear, be here. Thank you for having us on this show. And thank you for your vision, Daryl, in making this happen. I am Ramona Houston. I'm from a small town called Brownwood, Texas. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I am on a mission to help people give and serve. I am a scholar focusing on African-American and Mexican-American history and relations, a social impact strategist and host of the Empowerment Zone podcast. And my black girl magic lies in my ability to help businesses, public figures and organizations to transform their communities through social impact. Boom, and you got the work of Ben Crump a little while ago too. Yes. So give yourself some, some kudos for being on TV with Ben Crump. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Absolutely. All right, All right we, get, we get some Greek love in the house. My fellow new, new Benji Nunn, let us know what you do. My, yes, yes. And again, I'm happy to be here as well. Uh, it's a, been a tremendous year and uh, my name is Benji Nunn. I am the managing director of the Credit Hub a uh, lending platform that specializes in allowing um, members and people individually to retain equity as they grow their businesses. 
Um, and then obviously work in some of the other factors. We have a marketing division that allows us to be able to create divisions for the lenders themselves so that they can better present products to you guys. Um, and a uh, native of Atlanta, Georgia, travel a lot. So you may not hear the accent, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, born and bred and um, fully aware of all the, uh, of all, of all the, um, the, the amenities that Atlanta provides and uh, grateful to be a part of what's happening in this day and age today. Awesome. Thanks for jumping in, King. I'm going to go right below you to Miss Liz setting LinkedIn on fire. Liz, let us know what you do besides amazing posts. Um, my name is Liz Liba. I'm the bringer of truth. I My gift to the Black culture is baby edges, lashes, and popping lipstick. Um, <laughs> I'm a Black history connoisseur. Because I learned to be woke in high school long before it was a thing. Actually, it was a thing because we were listening to Public Enemy wearing kente cloth and rocking our black medallion. So I, I've been an educator for 20 years. I've been in higher education. I've worked in pretty much uh, every aspect of education in terms of different sectors. So I've worked in community colleges, the public um, traditional schools. I've worked in career colleges. I've worked for um, a lot of private online schools. Um, face to face, and most lately, I've been working for the past almost a decade as an instructional designer, which I do for a small career college. And my newest venture has been the Black History and Culture Academy, where I'm delivering 20 plus um, small micro learning courses on Black history, including African American studies, African studies, and diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, I've been really advocating the idea of speaking up very vociferously, as those that follow me probably have seen, about the plight of Black folk in America. And I think that it's really important for us to celebrate our history, but also understand that we've had a lot of struggle <clears throat> and that needs to be acknowledged in order for us to fix it. So that's been primarily what I've been doing over the past year or so, was featured in the Black LinkedIn article that was written about those that have been very outspoken on LinkedIn. That was by the New York Times, a writer called Ashanti Martin. And most recently, I had an article around Thanksgiving that was uh, an op-ed piece that was published by CNN, had about 2 million hits on their website, so it went viral. And it was about my own incident of being racially profiled and arrested for um, false arrest for um, shoplifting, which I did not do. I had a receipt for the item. It was a $2 item. And that was when I was at the University of Florida. So I talked about that experience and why racial profiling and criminalizing of black and brown children is something that needs to end. Awesome. Well, thank you for letting us all know all that, Liz. I'm going to rotate down to you to Ms. Chara Jackson, Madam Money. I guess I need to take my mute off. I guess I would help, right? <laughs> my name is Chara Jackson, a.k.a. Madam Money, author of Financial Fornication. I love helping people have healthier and sexier relationships with their money and avoid those financial STDs, substantially tremendous debt. I am also the founder of Noor and a new book coming out called The Dualpreneur Bible and Commandments to starting a successful side business. Um, I love helping black small businesses look like Fortune 500 companies online, regardless of their size. So I own a um, business solutions company that provides website design development as well as business coaching. So I'm just happy to be blackity black the day before my birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, well, happy pre-birthday. <laughs> we'll say pre-birthday. Mm -hmm. All right, you. Mr. Pierre Campbell, Mr. let's go. Let's know what you do, King. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're going to do happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to LinkedIn, y'all. Let's go. <laughs> Listen, I love doing this. Thank you, Daryl, for your vision. Thank you, PB family. Thank you, everybody that's watching. I am Pierre Campbell. I'm a leadership coach. What I do is I help people to articulate their value and organizations to do the same thing so they can have higher earning potential. Why is that important? Because right now, as you can see, this world is looking at everything outside of them as individuals or organizations and not seeing their values. And right now we need to all know our value as individuals and our organizations need to understand that the value is in 
the strengths of each individual that's working for your company. So that's what I help people do. And the other thing I always tell people is your passion, does, it shows you, it shows when you feel the pain of other people. So what pain do you feel? And I feel the pain of leaders. So that's why I do leadership coaching. I'm also a diversity inclusion magnet right now. It's crazy right now how many companies are coming to me, me and my organization to do diversity inclusion training, which is based in human relational skills. What is human relational skills? It's just knowing how to deal with people. It doesn't have to do with race. It's just unconscious bias. We all got it. Microaggressions, we all have them. And allyship, we all need allies. So that's what I do. We're going to turn it over to the brandpreneur. Took your job. Go ahead, Nick. You got it. Good afternoon. My name is Nick F. Nelson, Brandpreneur. You can call me Brandpreneur. I help remarkable people, products, and organizations do two things get noticed. I help you do that by helping you to brand your brilliance to the world. Leveraging social media, I do that through content development, image development, also through my latest venture called Brand Tribe that you can find on brandtribe.io. My gift to the world is that I'm a whole mood. I'm an entire mood because it's all about energy. It's about the energy that you bring to the world because you are an experience. Did you know that you're an experience? You are experiential. You can either be a good experience. You can be a bad experience. You can be a memorable experience or you can be a forgettable experience. Which one do you want to be? I choose to be unforgettable because I am a mood. Three things and three words that describe me that you will never forget. I'm flashy, I'm classy, and don't tell anybody. I just have a little hint of ghetto. The ghetto makes it interesting. <laughs> I love it. That, look, I should have prefaced this with like, we're, M Michelle going after this is perfect timing for people that know the PB family. So this is a perfect segue oh, here. We got the Alpha and the AKA Stop next to each other. Michelle. Come on, <laughs> tell them what we tell them. Tell them how you run, Michelle. Ooh, come on now. She's one of I my. am the brandpreneur. Don't be fooled by any of it. Oh. It's me. I'm flashy. I'm fresh, <laughs> and I'm all oh, the girls want my. Ooh, don't say it. I don't know. I, I had to do something big going after Nick. I mean, what do you? How do you follow that, right? All right. Good morning, guys. My name is Taylor Willis. <laughs> My name is Michelle Taylor Willis, and I am in media. I own a media company where we give small businesses the opportunity to advertise. I'm the host of the According to Michelle TV show right here in Atlanta. I'm also the host of the According to Michelle radio show. And my gift to the world is empowerment. I empower people to empower people, right? I do that through media, like I just told you, but I also do that through speaking. I travel around the nation talking about vision, mindset, sales, because everybody's in sales business planning and entrepreneurship and parenting. I'm an award-winning author, speaker, entrepreneur, and I'm a master strategist. And I'm very excited to be here for another Professionally Black with the Brandpreneur. I'm also <laughs> with Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And big shout out to my girl, Liz UF in the house. Later, babe. All right. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, last two to get into Miss Winter Wheeler. Winter is coming. Hi, y'all. I'm sorry I was late. I was having some tech issues. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm here now and I'm excited. So, yes, my name is Winter Wheeler. I am a mediator and arbitrator here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm available online um, across the country. But uh, I would say that my gift to the world is my empathy. I use my empathy to help people in my mediations. And for those who don't know, um, a mediator brings people together and I help them resolve their problems. And the way that I do that, that's a bit different than the way other people do it, is that I'm very, very focused on the feelings and emotions, needs, desires of the people who come before me. And I try to help them get back to a place where they can feel complete, feel whole, feel seen, and have their feelings and emotions 
validated throughout the process and uh, we get better results that way. I'm also the host of a podcast called The Mediate Now. And that show focuses on how mediation techniques can be applied in everyday life and, you know, directly to problems that you have every single day. And again, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. And rounding us out, King Tamante. Let us know what you do, King. Uh oh, I think he's frozen up. Oh, there he goes. You're on mute, Tamante. Hey, everybody. I love the energy in this group. Uh, glad to see all y'all today. Uh, my name is Tamonte Leary. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a founder. I am uh, I'm a proud father. I am a lawyer, but I don't practice. Uh, and I work for Microsoft uh, in the education space. Uh, very proud to represent uh, Blacks at Microsoft, or as we call BAM. Uh, we've been, we're always very active, but we've been very active this uh, so far this Black History Month, um, just actually rang the bell, the NASDAQ bell down uh, in New York, the closing bell last week. And just in general, um, I'm all about, uh, just like Winter said, I like to be with empathy. I'm all about helping people um, when it comes to tech space and when it comes to um, diversifying the tech space and inclusion, I'm all about that. Um, so I really um, am trying to increase representation in the tech field when it comes to uh, BIPOC, Black and Indigenous people of color. Um, I'm a founder of an ed tech startup, Class Updates, and also a founder of Black Men Talk Tech, um, where we have our annual conference each year. Uh, Black Men Talk Tech is an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial collective of Black founders who um, come together to um, create networks and relationships with the wider tech ecosystem uh, to help us scale our companies, um, network and and ideate and educate. Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for everybody letting us know what you do. And you guys know who I am, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip past that. But the thing I wanted to kind of um, focus on here today was, first off, if you're in the comments, thank you. I'm showing the comments on the screen. I will give you a little hidden secret to LinkedIn Live. Don't just keep it in the comments. Look at the people commenting, connect with them. The speakers here are all very open to talking to people and helping them in their area of expertise. So please reach out to the speakers and reach out to those in the comments. Um, today's co topic was the gift of blackness. Um, obviously this is Black History Month where it should be all year, but this is the month we focus on it. And um, I wanted to kick it off with what, what Kelly Blackman calls the light skin Tupac over here talking about Liz is the light skin Tupac. The, uh, <laughs> the gift of blackness is something we don't always realize kind of early on. Well, let, let me say this, not a lot of people realize it young like Liz did. So there's a gift we have, but we also see it differently as each kind of person. So for Liz, you mentioned being woke when you were younger. What do you think was a catalyst for you? Because there's people watching this at all different ages that are kind of grappling with this. What do you think was a catalyst for you to realize being black was a gift and not a curse? Yeah, well, I'm like 21 Savage. I'm from UK. So people always get disappointed because they're like, wait a second, I just Elba isn't really a drug dealer. He's actually from South London. Like, how is that? That's me, right? I came here when I was 12. I grew up on the east side of Fort Lauderdale. Um, I went to predominantly black middle school as well as a predominantly black high school. And once I got to high school, it was like public enemy. It was like NWA. It was like two life crew. Everybody was coming into the idea that blackness was something to be celebrated. It's something to be like from the rooftop screaming out about how great it was to be black. Rodney King had just happened, the LA riots. And I think at that time, our teachers really at a 90% black school, um, I would say, just looking at the stats, because I just looked it up the other day, because I'm like, what was going on at that school? 80% of the students, um, poverty level, 83% or 83% poverty level, I think 81% qualified for free lunch, and I was in that number. So I was empowered by teachers that cared, teachers that really wanted us to understand the beauty in our blackness. They wanted us to understand that even though there were drug dealers out on the corner, we didn't have to be a drug dealer. We didn't have to be someone that had no hope that even though we were coming, a lot of us from homes that our parents were working two jobs, or maybe we didn't even have a parent in the household. We were raising younger children. Like a lot of the time I was the, the, the primary caregiver for my younger brothers because both my parents were working all the time, that that didn't mean that I still didn't have greatness in my future. And I went to school with Michelle, uh, at University of Florida, I was there on a full scholarship. Michelle was way out of my league, so I didn't really talk to her on campus, but <laughs> be that as it may, 
<laughs> I was no, at a no young I gotta age. interject. Whatever. What? <laughs> I'm just playing. No, Michelle was super cool. But I did learn at a young age that being black was something to be proud of. And I learned black history. I did a poll on LinkedIn a couple weeks ago or a week ago, and I said, how many people took black history in high school or in college? 50% of people never took a black history class in college or in K through 12. That's problematic because that means half of the people that are out here making hiring decisions, saying they don't see color, uh, are the ones that are driving the policy of their company and the initiatives, whether it be DEI, what Pierre is talking about, or whatever the initiatives are, don't understand the history of black folk in America. And as someone that wasn't from here, I felt like I needed to understand what was the catalyst for a lot of the things that were happening that I was seeing around me, like the Rodney King riots and the verdict that happened and, and why black folk felt disenfranchised. And I think that's a part of what makes the study of history so important. Black folk yeah. are not a monolith, so we all have different experiences, but what took us from here to here and understanding that process, the evolution, all of the richness and beauty of African American history and culture, but also understanding the legacy of disenfranchisement and how do we fix something if we're not ready to acknowledge it or make a change if we don't really know or understand what that involves. And, and that's why I was woke at a young age because my teachers would not let us not understand African history and culture and the importance of how we came to where we are. I told somebody the other day and they laughed. It was like the opposite of roots. It was like, your name's not Elizabeth. Get in that book, <laughs> pick an African name, and that's what we're going to refer to you because Africa is beautiful. Africa is rich. Africa is culture. Africa is not a jungle or whatever you saw on TV, a hut. Africa is civilization. Africa is math. Africa is astro astronomy. Africa is all these things that they didn't teach you what's happening. Yeah, science, surgery, long medicine. Before, long before there were even civilizations in Europe. And a lot of people, when I post on LinkedIn, that Africa was a, the cradle of civilization and black folk are everybody's parents. They get really upset. But archaeologists were the ones that said that. I didn't say that. So I'm just reporting. So I want to make sure, and I'm sure some of the historians in the group can kind of um, co-sign that, that people just understand the accuracy of our history so that we can move forward without whitewashing and pretending that black folk are just marginal to the whole process of what our global, our global impact is. Yeah, speaking of historians, I wanna bring Ramon on this part because I think that's a big issue a lot of us face when we kind of see, like you said, 50% aren't getting the education in high school and college, and then they get into leadership positions. And you believe what you're taught. You know, if you see a history book say a certain way, Black history jokingly is MLK, a sprinkle of Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, and civil rights. Like that's that's pretty much the nutshell of what you get for Black history. But Ramona, you're an historian for Black and Brown civilization. So as a historian, I mean, there's, there's an issue where people don't care about history. It seems like the youth. But are you seeing a lot of things repeating in your history that you learned that we can learn from now to help people kind of move forward as a people? Uh, yes, thanks for having me. I think that one of the first things uh, in our celebration of Black History Month, we need to recognize Carter G. Woodson, who is indeed the founder of Black History Week. He was the uh, second African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard University, with the first being that eminent scholar W.E.B. Du Bois. And so when we look at Black history, I think that, uh, I, I know we're going to get in a conversation about this, about why do we have just one month versus uh, a whole year of celebration. It's up to us to celebrate, celebrate the whole year. And when I say us, I mean all people, all Americans, people, humanity all over the world. Uh, you know, we're supposed to love all year long, right? We're supposed to be thankful all year long, but we have a day celebrating Thanksgiving, right? We're supposed to give all year long, but we have Christmas to celebrate, uh, celebrate giving. And so I think, uh, Af um, black History Month is a moment for us to actually honor and celebrate black history. In terms of your question about the repetition, yes, this has always been a complaint uh, within the African-American and Latino communities that we have been seen on the margins of, uh, of in, in American history books. And that's why it's so important that we do seminars like this, that we write books, that we tell our own stories, uh, and that we bring um, our histories and our experiences to the center so that we can embrace our history and culture and also have others to recognize the significant 
political, economic, and social uh, impact that we've had on this uh, on our communities, nation, and world. I love it. And real quick, Nick, that I know somebody that's been you know purposeful working in the black community, and you had a very rich path with your father, kind of helping you with learning black history. Yeah. Um, that gift for you, that gift seemed like it was always shown to you that being black was cool. So, what do you think was that age when your father kind of instilled in you? Hey, it's good to be black and don't worry about what your teachers are saying and what society's saying. Uh, it was soon as I came out the womb, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was um, he was very instrumental in terms of um, building the first black studies, one of the first black studies programs uh, in the country at Ohio State University. And so at an early age, I was exposed to um, just great black uh, men and women doing great things. And he always kept me grounded and um, prideful in terms of who I was. So I never had any sort of um, any sort of question in terms of my greatness. One of the most influential moments in my life was when we took a trip to Africa when I was around, I'd say about nine or 10 years old. And I remember getting on an airplane, all black pilots, all black crew. And I had never seen anything like that in my life. And it was for that one moment or that moment there that I realized that, man, we we are doing some of everything and can do some of everything. And so um, I say if there was a moment where I really saw the greatness of being black and um, uh, my black skin was at that time. And and, and that's why, you know, was, I, I try to I try to do this with my son and encourage other people to do it. It's all about exposure. Everything's exposure, right? It's exposing um, our children um, to other people who look like them that are doing great things. And that's why I'm so happy that we have so many you know, young people uh, like that Amanda sister. Oh, my God. She is just such an inspiration, mm -hmm. man, to see her from the highest platforms. The first poet to ever, you know, open up a Super Bowl. And she is a chocolate black girl who loves to wear colorful outfits. I mean, how more and how much more inspirational can you get? So it's kind of like, you know, just taking that moment and those moments, I think, is just important us as, as parents. But you know, to answer your question, man, I've always I've always had a, an appreciation uh, for being black. Wouldn't want to be anything else. And the thing I think about this, too, people need to realize these conversations are important to see because we don't get it all the time. We usually get how bad it is. <laughs> we see yeah. in the media how bad it is. Like, oh, somebody robbed the liquor store. Oh, it was a black guy being shown on the 11 o'clock news. It's so the reason these conversations are important to me, because if you didn't get it as a kid, you're definitely not going to get it as an adult. Right. Um, you're not going to really get people to edify the black culture and kind of put a light on it. But right now, that's the point of this here. And and Winter, I know you're working in a very you know Caucasian dominated space in the uh, legal field. So for you, it's probably you know I mean I know you walk in the room and they kind of just know instantly you're black, obviously. But for you to keep yeah. that mindset strong for the gift, because it's probably hard in a room a sea of white people to feel like you have a gift right there. So what do you kind of do for people that are in that position? They're in a very whitewashed industry. What do you do to kind of recognize and keep your gift strong in your mind? Oh, man. You know, my parents, as far back as I can remember, they just spent a lot of energy telling me how how special I was and how beautiful it was to be Black and how my dark skin was amazing and gorgeous and special. And... Yeah, I just I internalize that, thank goodness. Um, but of course, when I go into these spaces where everyone is white, everyone's older than me, typically male, it's uncomfortable. But I I have that base, you know, where I know that my opinions matter. I'm as intelligent as everybody else in the room typically more, <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to work my behind off to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. When I show up to the meeting, I'm more prepared than everybody else. You know, I know that what I'm saying is right. I know it. You know, you don't want to be loud and wrong. So you know, <laughs> my mom told me, don't be loud and wrong. So I try to be loud and right. Um, but that's really, that's really all it is. You know, it's being told and having it reaffirmed. And I was, you know, 
at the time clearly did not understand how blessed I was. My father was a doctor. I had, you know, uncles and, and aunts who were attorneys and physicians. And for me, that was just, that was just how life was. And I remember mom, my mom telling me, because I asked her, I said, can I be president one day? Because I've never seen a president that looked like me. And she said, well, honey, why the hell couldn't you be? <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my parents were just very much like, they were always telling me that I could do anything that I wanted. It didn't matter who had or had not done it before. Just keep pushing, keep moving. And now I know what a blessing that was. And I'm trying to give that to my kids now. Granted, my kids are half black, <laughs> half white, um, uh, but they are uh, black appearing. They, you know, I don't like that whole passing thing, whatever. I, that's a whole different conversation. But my children are black, look black, whatever. And those are conversations that I have with them now. You know, I make sure that they know that they're, you know, different from their dad, um, but that it's beautiful and that there's a, a long history and we talk about the struggle and I just have, you know, been working with them on that um, for so long that it's just, it's just natural for them um, when they, you know, they'll start talking about these things themselves. They'll tell their classmates, you know, my kids are three, four, seven, and nine. And my four-year-old is my little girl. She's the the most, <laughs> the most mouthy of the crew, I'll say. Um, and she'll be, you know, she's doing her schooling here and I'll hear her talking about how wonderful it is to be black, um, mm -hmm. telling her classmates and telling her teacher and being super excited about Black History Month because they're learning about a new person every single day. So mm -hmm. shout out to the Walker School for doing that. I've been able to hear it and it has been fantastic, high level, mm -hmm. quick, funny story, and then I'll stop talking. So they were talking today about making promises and the types of promises black people have made in the past. Remember, she's she's in pre-K. So the teacher said, now, right now, Joe Biden is the president. And just a little bit before him was Barack Obama. Like she just completely <laughs> it was the funniest thing I have ever seen. Because if she had mentioned yeah. his name, my little girl would have gone on. She she always calls him Donald Dump. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a smart Donald. girl. <laughs> it, as, as he was talking, I made me think about something Tamante posted a while ago. He said, like, uh, being black is is scary as hell, but it's kind of lit. Or something like that. Yes, it I is. Saw in, that in your everyday in features, yeah, in your everyday your everyday life, like I still I don't break any laws. My license is up to date. My registration is good. <laughs> my insurance is good. If I see a cop <laughs> behind me, I'm trying to go somewhere and pull over and park. Like, uh, uh I'm not. I don't have time because I, I got pulled over as a kid. I was 15 or something, and my friend had a little rabbit hanging from the rearview mirror. It's probably like two inches, and the cop from wherever pulled us over for that. And we're like, there's no way you saw that from five feet away. Because, you know, he just pulled us over because it's a black kid driving a white Acura. That isn't right. That, and this is in the 90s. That doesn't make sense. So I still have fears of that. But Tamanta, you kind of you posted that you work in education space, too. Um, you're always putting out information for people to see black history, like the wealthiest person in the world is an African king and things of that nature to let people know we're not just, you know, downtrodden. So for someone in the education space and the tech space, someone actually put a comment. Can we talk about women in tech? Do you see that gift being weaker in the tech space since there's so free, so few, few of us in that area? Well, I, I mean, nah, the gift of the gift of uh, blackness, I, I believe, is is even greater uh, in in the, in the area because there's so few of us, and um, obviously, us contributing to the in, uh, inclusiveness and diversity of organizations like Microsoft and, and just tech companies in general. Um, some some recent statistics were were shared with us at Microsoft. I believe um, about three point eight percent of of employees are. I may it may be like four point nine percent. I may I may be one percentage point off, but um, of of employees all up at Microsoft are black. Um, so think about that, right? That means out of ten people, that's zero, um, right? And then out of out of a hundred people. Um, Technically, four point nine. You can't round up. You can't have a fraction of a person, <laughs> right? 
four people, right, out of 100, as far as the organization that I currently work at, our employees all up are black. Um, so with that being said, um, it, it's, it's very important to uh, for, for there to be a collective focus on diversifying uh, the tech space and the tech fields, not only with um, uh, with women uh, in tech, black women in tech, but black men in tech, uh, like myself as well. And really, every every field that I that I have professional experience in, uh, I face uh, you know abysmal numbers when it comes to representation. Right? I am a lawyer. I don't practice, but I was a lawyer before anything. Uh, became a lawyer in two thousand and nine, and. We we know what the uh, what what the you know winter can tell you right. We know what the the numbers look like in the legal field when it comes to representation. Um, same with education, especially when it comes to higher education. You know, I'm a professor. Um, you're not going to have that many professors that look like me. Um, I you know at, at uh, you know at, at majority you know white institutions or majority um, you know even Hispanic serving institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and that also needs to change. And then, of course, I just mentioned the numbers in tech. Um, and then, of course, I'm a founder as well. So when it comes to venture capital, we've mentioned how abysmal the the, the numbers are when it comes to, you know, less than one percent of my capital goes to folks that look like myself. So I'm 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 in it, and you know, uh, multiple fronts as far as uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity, and you know, as far as the gift of blackness, you know, I had examples really from a young age that really, you know, let me know how, how special it was. Uh, started with my grandfather who was a, a, a black pastor. I don't know if anybody else has experience with a, having a, a grandfather or a father uh, who's a pastor of a church, but not only was he a black pastor, he was a, also a, a Presbyterian pastor, which is, which is rare um, <laughs> uh, when it comes to black pastors, right? Um, we, uh, you do see them, but at the end of the day, you know, a lot of black pastors are Baptist, you know, Methodist, et cetera. So him leading a Presbyterian church, uh, also um, not only been the leader of a Presbyterian church, but uh, been one of the first blacks uh, in the real estate industry to uh, be a licensed realtor in the state, of, in the uh, city of North Carolina. Um, which get your in, Amazon in, package tomorrow. Get your Amazon package. I know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> that might be. Is that the police? Are they listening? Yeah, to no, that? no, it was. It was actually, 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 actually my crew? daughter, right? They're knocking like the police. It's actually my, my daughter. Radical. Right? 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 Coming back, but well, this, this um, line about to make a turn for the worst. Yeah, 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 right? 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 It was terrible timing, but uh, <laughs> my grandfather was the first black to do um, a lot in the real estate field in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and one of them was to be a, you know, have his own Century 21 uh, real estate office and be licensed by the North Carolina Realtors Association. He was the first black to do that. And obviously he was a member of Cap Alpha Psi, me being a legacy uh, as well. So all of those things, um, you know, I, I went to a black high school. I went to West Charlotte Senior High School with a, a lion for our mascot, Lions Pride. And that, that Lion Pride that we had, I should say that pride uh, that, uh, you know, for, I should say from the mascot of the lion transcended yeah. into us as students, right? And being very proud to be black, um, black students at West Charlotte, a predominantly black school. Well, I want to cut you off, Martha. You had some funny comments coming in because you're a door knock. We had <laughs> opportunity yeah, to like knock knock. twice or does it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, the thing about is it that is, the popo was <laughs> Renee. I, was, you know, I was supposed to be home alone. And so I was like, maybe that's a package. Mm -hmm. um, this is the best right. thing in my life. Is that yeah. pizza, Rosalind yeah. Krieger, and Carter? Yeah. 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 That's what I love about mm -hmm. Black people. Mm -hmm. Man, mm -hmm. we know we got a sister mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real quick, um, <laughs> I want to uh, pivot real quick for uh, Tara, because, I mean, Tara, you, you've been kind of working in, you mentioned before being in Baltimore, Maryland, and you know, different areas that weren't as Black as much. So you realize you come into Atlanta. You got to a place that had a lot of Black people and kind of realized the two-sidedness of it. So when you look at the, the gift you had, how do you think the world perceived your gift when you walk into a room of financial experts? So oh, Terry, you got mutes though. Again, the, the mute thing kills me all the time. <laughs> Internationally, it's embraced because it's not a lot of black women that are speaking about international finance. So for example, Al Jazeera English, I get called 
all the time to speak on those subjects. So they're excited to see a black woman, you know, talk about international because their their gamut is just white males. Um, and I grew up in the fin- matriculated in financial services industry, and in most cases in the boardroom, I was the only um, African American and the only female in the boardroom, and I figured out how to maneuver it. One of the things I did want to mention is that you know you're powerful when people will try. No one tries to destroy something that is not powerful. You know what I'm saying? If you're not powerful, you're not on radar. But if you're powerful, they're either going to try to bring you down, shut you down, shut you up. And that's how you know how powerful you are as a black person, as you know, the power of our blackness. Um, that anyone that will put this much effort to stop us from living, this much effort to stop us from living, we have to be some major powerful beings in this earth. That's that's just my opinion. Um, as far as the financial services realm. It, it's, it was a challenge because it is predominantly white males. Um, it, you know, they needed a bank, needed a law, the, the Community Reinvestment Act, to uh, give back to the communities that they were housing in because it was cheaper but wouldn't lend to. Um, so it, it's just been really a big challenge. One of the things that really showed me the pride in being black. This my my dad used to drive us from Delaware to Opelika, Alabama every summer. Every <laughs> summer. That was a road trip. Delaware to Opelika, Alabama. And there was one one year we went to Tuskegee University. And I was just in so much awe that we did this. We, you know, this is our school. We, you know, I was just in so much awe to see that. Um that's what that enlightened me. And I think uh the next summer I think I wore a, a Malcolm X t-shirt <laughs> and my grandmother said, girl, you gonna get us hung in the South. <laughs> but I was like, nah, I'm black and I'm proud. I, I wore that uh, Malcolm X t-shirt um, really proudly. So that has been my experience with, with matriculating. Um, and in the financial services industry, I stand strong in my blackness. I think, um, Michelle was saying it or or was it winter that, you know, we got to prepare extra yep. uh, just to show up in a room and they're not even prepared. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate we have to do that, but they know our brilliance. Um, and in some cases, they envy our brilliance sometimes. And mm. what I found challenging in this space is having to dummy down. Yeah. And I stopped doing that uh, a few, maybe about 10 years ago to dummy down so that I, they wouldn't feel threatened by me so that I can keep my job. And when mm. I decided that it's not worth my integrity, it's not worth um, dummying down for that, they're going to have to brilliant up. And mm. so when I required them to brilliant up to me, um, that's when I got more respected. That's when I got honored. That's when they started pulling me into meetings. And so I think what, what I can leave here is that don't dummy down for anyone that doesn't understand your brilliance. You require them to brilliant up so that they understand and respect your brilliance. Yeah, I'm going to leave to Michelle and Pierre on that same topic of just you're walking in the room leading people. Both of you are leaders. And often there's a challenge with that when you're trying to lead different cultures, they can see you differently and they kind of perceive your gift differently. And you might know in your mind, this this is cool, but you know, you're leading certain people that don't you know necessarily agree with that. So Michelle, you've been in the media for a long time and leading and training and coaching people. For you, when you come across that space where it's not received so well, it's not received as much as you want it to be, what do you do as a black woman to kind of help you stay strong in that and not to dummy down kind of what, what Terry was saying? Yeah, let, let me make sure I understand your question. When what's not perceived exactly? Like your gift of being black, because you can walk into a room, say it's, you're training a, a historically Caucasian, you know, sales mm-hmm. team, or or uh, you're doing a media package for them, and you know you're good, but they're not receiving it that well because of who you are. So, Daryl, that's an interesting question because if that has ever happened, I'm not aware of it. I can't remember ever being in a room or in a situation where someone didn't take, if I'm the leader and I'm, I'm, I've am i established myself as that, or I've been you know, made to be that, I can't remember a situation where I ever thought or could see that that wasn't the case. 
I mean, when I'm in a room, whether I'm in front of a hundred white men, a hundred black men, a hundred black females, it's very clear that I'm the leader and I'm supposed to be there. And so people act accordingly. Um, this is why you're a, a boy mom. Boom. <laughs> so like, let, let's, let's break that down. I mean, though, there's some, there's some well, people that don't have that. So talk about where that came from. Well, so that's there's some women here that need help with that. So that's where I was going with that. So, so there is, so let me back up for a second. You know, I start, and you know this, Daryl, I start everything with this, this realm of confidence, right? I know I'm the best at what I do. Nobody does what I do better than me. And when I train leaders, entrepreneurs, coaches, whomever, salespeople, they, that's where I start. I start, do you confidently believe that you're supposed to be here, black, white, or otherwise? And if not, let's start with that, right? I'm the best at what I do. Nobody does what I do better than me. So when you show up in a room, they know you're there, whether you've spoken or not. And when you leave, they know that you're gone spoken or not. And when you start with that level of confidence and it's not an arrogance, it's not a like chip on your shoulder kind of thing. It's just, that's how you show up. And so what I encourage people as leaders, or if you're coaching leaders, if you want to be a leader, whatever it is, you have to start this air of confidence that you truly are the best at what you do. And nobody does what you do better than you. When you start there, then you're, all, you're starting at 100. So the only thing that could take you down from that is your lack of, lack of knowledge, your lack of expertise. And none of us have that, right? If you don't have that, then you can't be the best at what you do. So it, start, it always starts from confidence, always. And if you don't have that, then I wouldn't encourage you to show up in any room, especially a room, <laughs> where, you be, well, especially a room where you would be perceived because of your blackness as less than, less intelligent, less important, less received, less all of that. Do you, are y'all following me? Yeah, go, go where you're gonna set yourself up for the win. I think Pierre is gonna definitely pounce all over that, set yourself up for the win. Cause I mean, leadership's a big part of that. You right. don't wanna lead people down a path they're gonna fail. So uh, Pierre from the male perspective of that same Pierre, thing. Before Pierre right? goes, I do want to, uh, Michelle, she's right on it. Um, and any boardroom that I went in, I had to have that confidence because if you don't have that confidence, they will eat you alive. That's right. <laughs> you and, they'll, and they'll eat you alive, Tara, right? They'll eat you alive whether you're black, white, exactly. Right. Red, exactly. Period. Exactly. Period. Exactly. But, but you know, they're, they're just, they're just looking, looking for <laughs> that little ounce of insecurity. Yeah. When it, but when you stand your ground and you know what you know and you are confident in that, and I think that's one of the things that helped me, like Michelle, is that regardless of who's in a room, I'm terrible. I'm mad at money. Uh, you know, <laughs> I have that confidence. Right? I don't give a. I just don't give a. You know, so <laughs> I have confidence in whatever room that I'm in. I know my 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 stuff, and yeah. so I. That is the biggest thing. If we can tell anyone, is not only to be proud of who you are, be confident in your brilliance and your ability in whatever room you go into, whether it's all black, all white, all male, all female, or a mixture. Yeah. And can Pierre. I say something real quick? I'm sorry, Pierre. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can go real quick. Go okay, real, real quick. Real quick. Theater go. I he think go. <laughs> this group. We are. We're a special group, and that's why we're here, I think. And I know that when I would walk into rooms in law firms and, and now people take me seriously because I have proven myself and I am confident. But where I would see the discrepancies were in times where I wasn't supposed to be the leader of that conversation. For example, I was present during a committee meeting for our, our hiring committee, right? And I'm not in charge, I'm just on the committee. But what I was hearing when they were talking about the candidates who happened to be non-whites, so this was not just a commentary on black folks. There were a lot of weird things being said in this room. And it was just that stark reminder that they see me as different no matter what. I show up and I'm black and I'm different just because. Yeah. And it was it was so uncomfortable. 
But like I said, I, I'm always loud and always right. So <laughs> I said, no, you're not about to do this. What you just said was messed up. We're not going to have a conversation about somebody's accent. We're not doing that. That has yeah. nothing to do with their ability to do this job. And there were other Black people in the room, but they didn't have that I don't like give it any assumption. They didn't have that. <laughs> We're going to say confidence for if, if there's a, a baby yeah, watching yeah, us or something. We'll say the confidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's a but much Pierre, easier term. But Pierre, you, you have the accent. I mean, you're, you're Jamaican descent. You play football. So you, you kind of had some things that are, I think, are cool. But somebody could look at that as a negative, like, oh, he's a football player, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's Jamaican, of course. I mean, to own that as a black man in the room, uh, last time we had uh, Dr. Rashana Novellas, she talked about when you think of a, a man, you think of a black man, and usually it's a negative light to it. So for you walking in those boardrooms, like how is it you're gonna, you know, how do you hold on to your gift and know it's okay for people that aren't quite there yet? My mother did a great job. And I think as parents, all of us, we need to take this loving yourself very seriously. We put our children into an educational system that values everything outside of them. And we were in a part of that same educational system but the most important thing that a child or a human being or a person should do is love themselves, regardless of your skin color. Um, so what we're talking about is very important. My mother told me all the time, she said, boy, you're, you're special in this house, but when you go outside in that street, make sure you're straighten up, boy. You know, she would always tell me, make sure you straighten up and, you know, don't, don't be arrogant and, and things of that nature because, you know, you, you you have to understand that the world is full of diverse people and people from all different backgrounds and different beliefs, and they might not believe what you believe. And, and so when I look at that, what my mother did, I'm thankful and I'm blessed for that. And I do the same thing with my children. And now that's why I tell my children to love themselves. I always talk about the story where I, I bathe my children and I tell them, and we do in front of the mirror and say, I love myself. I love myself. I love myself. I love myself because God made me. Perfect, you know, so it's programming. Ultimately, at the end of the day, this is what's important. I, and, and I wanna bring this up because there is an issue that we're dealing with. We're dealing with an issue of advocacy, self-advocacy. So I've developed a framework. You're not gonna be able to see it, but I did that on purpose because I want <laughs> you to look for it. No, I want you to go look for it. I want everybody to go look for it. It's a self-advocacy, simple, simple intelligence, self-advocacy framework. The first part is confidence. Second part is speaking up and showing up. The next one is managing up. Then the uh, selection process and then gratitude. We need all of these things in order, to, in order to advocate for ourselves as people, regardless of your skin complexion or where you're from, you need that. And when, the reason why we're talking about this is because some of us have been told to love ourselves, Mwah. you know, to kiss yourself and all of that. Yeah, some of us have been told it, but some have not. Have not. And if you look at the biases, that's the, the programming and the radio and TV, I used to work in radio, it's all showing you things that are the opposite of what you should, you should love about yourself. So, yeah. so that's, that, that's, what I, that's why I, I believe that what we're talking about right now is important for all people because every single person has bias and mm -hmm. the biases that they have can be projected black or white or Asian or whatever your race is can be projected on other people. And speaking of which, I love all the white allies, the, the less melanated people, all of us have melanin, just different amounts of that. So understand the power of melanin is powerful. I love like Deb Health Rich in here saying, the message of black excellence in this broadcast are disrupting all the hate that has existed in the shadows for so long. Now that it can be face head on as a society, prejudice is going to extinct. Uh, Rosalind Krieger, she's in Canada and she's an ally. And I think the thing that's important about this is um, I'm bringing Martin into this. We, we kind of we don't realize the power our skin has. That people want what we have, in essence. Uh, a while ago, we had Deith Giles talking about getting the injections and the, the lip shots and all these things. And the reason we were slaves, because we can handle working in the field because of melanin. Our, our skin could handle being in the sun for hours on end where they would get sunburned after 10 minutes. So that's something that was a powerful thing. But as you know, Martin, you're working with different boards and different DEI conversations. A lot of people don't even know what melanin is. That's one thing. <laughs> they don't even know what it actually is. But for you, as going into different parts of you know, Gen X now to Gen Z, the young people have more access to information. So what do you do to help them see their gift of blackness in the different places you go into? 
Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, actually, while this is happening, I am my company, uh, my business partner and I have a company called uh, Strategy B, and we're hosting the USDA has decided to reach out to HBCU students from the 1890 land grant um, colleges and offer them 800 jobs. So this is the first cohort of 65 uh, students going through this program as we speak right now. It'll be going on for four months. So the 20 land grant colleges um, that have uh, agriculture students, they are being onboarded, uh, resume building, and then tomorrow they'll be interviewed by what is called state conservationists. And these are 42 persons of color who have been successfully matriculated through the, the USDA program. And the USDA program right now has an acting director who's committed, Terry uh, Cosby, who's committed to making sure these 800 jobs go to HBCU students. So um, to answer your question though, I noticed that um, trying to be very intentional about where I work in and what I do, um, the young people that are asking questions today, they're seniors and some of them are grad students. And they're asking basic questions like, if I, I'm from a small town of Fort Valley, if I move to Arizona or Hawaii, how do I actually, you know, how do I exist? I think in the chat, in the uh, comments, there was Kevin uh, Pratt, Braggs, Sprags, Spragans that said that um, he used to carry his um, check, his, his check stub in his um, glove compartment. So if he got pulled over, he mm -hmm. could show that he actually had the ability to have this money. Yeah. And so I think what I heard from the um, baby boomer generation that's at the USDA and also my, my generation, which were Gen Xers, um, pour into these young people and say that, listen, it's gonna be difficult you know, figuring it out, but we're a family. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the gift of blackness. Uh, no matter where we go, if we show up on Facebook, we show up on TikTok, and we show up wherever we show up, we show up. And it's the hashtag what? Is black TikTok, is black Clubhouse, <laughs> is black LinkedIn, is black Facebook. And so we wherever we show up, our gift is that we show up as a community together. Yeah, and I, and I love that this is happening more. Somebody put in the comments that they think the pandemic is increasing the, the community of the black culture where we're talking together more. I think she said, yeah. Um, one of the thing about this pandemic, it allows the black community to reimagine education for our black people. Um, and that's, I mean, it's true. This is the information age. If you don't know, and you should be connecting everybody in the comments, you should connect with these folks and talk because I want this to have action come out of this. This isn't just the talk about Kumbaya thing. Everybody on this panel has worked together in some regard or is doing things together. And that's what we used to do as a people. We used to work together. It wasn't so much you do your thing, I do my thing. And Benji, I know you're working in the credit space and kind of you and I started out when you mentioned Fort Valley Martin, that's where Benji and I met. So good history lesson there, but <laughs> being in that space, we had to, we were in the middle of nowhere. We had to embrace each other because there's nothing around for an hour and nobody had a car. So that forced us to have the culture and community, but Benji, now you're back in Atlanta. How important do you see it is for black professionals that actively intentionally reach out to kind of make relationships and make business happen? Nope, oh, you're on mute. Even more so today, especially um, someone mentioned, like you said, the, the pandemic and COVID and where we are today. I think we are, I think we long for it. I think we actually realize we miss each other and not just, you know, uh, today, but just in general, right? The, some of the just regular interactions. Those are important. I mean, in life and in business, relationships are key, right? Um, and I think a lot of our our contribution uh, contributions to the culture are being recognized because everyone is is seeing the same or seeing through the same lens that we're able to see through, right? It's um, um, you, you you can't miss it, you know. Not to bring up a, a lot of what we already know about, but you know, to stick on moving forward. Um, I think the key to it is going to be more interactions like this, right? So I think obviously if when, when we can uh, get back out, um, you know, um, um, you know, in traditional um, settings, we're going to appreciate those things more too, right? I think just appreciation is going to overall uh, be the 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 key, right? Some of those simple things, right? So mm -hmm. business is going to be more relationship driven, right? And you know, how do you do that in a virtual environment? You know, interactions just like this, right? Where you're able to kind of um, pick the brain and obviously um, gain context, you know? So mm -hmm. I think context is probably given this year across the board. 
Yeah, speak, speaking of being intentional with that, Michelle's been very passionate about this, of being intentional about working with black business. And you run a media company trying to change the narrative for black people. So as we go through this, you know, we're in 2021, COVID's not gone. Um, what's an actionable step you're going to give to the audience and the people watching this to kind of help move the message forward and not just be all talk? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Daryl. So th the first thing is always it's, it's intention. And we're talking a lot about it right here. I believe most things start with confidence and then it's intention and execution. So if you can intentionally execute on whatever that looks like for you to further the call. So I have one of my friends that I work with and he is intentional about paying black businesses first. Whenever he has black <laughs> vendors, if he's like running out of money, <laughs> he pays all the black vendors first because he's mm -hmm. like, I have to do my part to keep black businesses in business, right? So I think it's really about figuring out exactly where you want your space to be, what you want mm -hmm. your legacy to be. I start, I reverse engineer, right? So I start with the end in mind. What do you want your end to be? And then put goals and action plans in, 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 in line in order to make that happen, right? So for him, it's about making sure his black Hey, for me, it's about making sure that my black businesses have a voice. And that's what we do in the media company. So I make sure that if I get somebody that doesn't have as much budget as some of my larger businesses, I work with them. I make sure that I'm intentional about making sure that these people can advertise. Right. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's intention. Our parents were all intentional about making sure we knew we were black and what that looked like. Right. And that's why we're every single person on this panel. Has said <clears throat> my parents were intentional. And because of that, we are here. And yes. So if, if you it doesn't matter what you're going to do, but if you decide that you're going to be intentional about something and then you actually do it, you actually have the, the opportunity to change the freaking world. How awesome is that? Because there are 10 people right here, 11 people right here that are doing that. So figure it out, whatever it is you're going to do. Be <laughs> and, bring... on it and execute on it. And I got to jump. I got to be I'm going to get a jump. Yeah, I want to get Liz on this real quick. Right I'm going to get a jump off. Bye, guys. Thanks, Michelle. To go, but I did want to say something that Michelle is that intentionalness. I was very intentional in 2019. 2020. I was very intentional, intentional on working with Black women on websites because I got sick of seeing us look crazy on the internet. We were looking crazy on the internet. And so I want to make sure that we look like we were Fortune 500 companies online um, and we can do that. And it was it was reasonable to do that. And so I started SRT yeah. the solutions for websites because I needed us to be intentional about how we present our that is why it's very important, like you um, said, to be very intentional with your business, with your money, with what you are going to do, because that is going to change the trajectory of someone else's business, of where we're trying to go in this movement. So I wanted to say that everybody that's in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm going to be there next week. So hopefully we can social distance um, so I can do a turn up for my late birthday. <laughs> <market. laughs> <Just saying. I'm> <laughs> I'll, I'll turn the virtue to you, but Liz, as you, as you have a lot of visibility right now, you want to LinkedIn's top voices. You've been featured in a couple of different publications. I, I, I want to be clear that people have to come out of things and action actually happens because I think sometimes we get allured by the fame of being seen, but actually not making something happen. And uh, like Malcolm X was accused of that. This is about him being famous and not about him pushing the message forward. So you have your gift. You recognize it. You embrace it. What are some actionable things people watching this can do to take away from this and actually make something happen, whether they have a lot of melanin or no melanin? Great question. I think I get asked that all the time. Somebody. That's me. Oh, sorry. I was like, somebody wants a credit card. Okay, so I get asked that a lot by those that if they have me on a panel or a podcast, if someone's an ally or somebody's in our community, they want to figure out how they can be more intentional. We've heard intentionality has been said as a, a, a buzzword or catch phrase as far as how we can make change. And I always tell people, I say this on my team uh, at my uh, institution, as far as working in higher education, I also say this as far as social justice is to work in your sphere of influence. 
There are going to be people that are heavily into education. There are going to be people that are DEI in the corporate sphere trying to get companies to change their approach. We, we are going to see those that are on the front lines, maybe protesting and pushing that narrative. And I think everyone has their gift. My gift is that I'm a writer and I love to talk and educate because that's what I've done for the past 20 years. So that's what I've used to mobilize my power. That's what I feel is my superpower. Somebody may be a stay at home mom and it's like, look at your child's play area. Do you Are you showing your child a variety of different toys or reading books that have different characters? Because we all know that media and the narrative that even at a small, young age, my son is biracial and he's asking me, well, mommy, how come your skin is brown and my skin is white like daddy's? And he wants to understand why that's happening. And mommy, I want you to, I want you to look like me. So children, when people say children don't see color, children don't understand, that is not true. He's only six. So I think that we need to understand just exactly how much all these different images and everyone has a role to play. Whatever your role is, whatever your sphere of influence is, work in that. You know, I think a lot of times we're hearing, what can I do? Well, where do you work? Can you, if someone's talking over me in a meeting, will you say, hold on, Liz is talking? Because those kinds of things, those microaggressions, when we're saying, well, everyone deals with microaggression or everyone, you, black people are <laughs> currently the most marginalized people in the country. So to say that all folk are dealing with issues, yeah, but like you said on one of your previous uh, podcasts or one of your previous panels, Daryl, the house of black America is burning. Mm -hmm. you know, when, you're, when you're in a plane and it's going down, they say put the mask on the most vulnerable people first, right? They don't say go run to the front of the plane and put the mask on the six foot five, 220 pound person <laughs> first class. You put the mask on the most vulnerable. And right now we are the most vulnerable. We're asking for equity, which means that we have been marginalized for 150 years since the Emancipation Proclamation occurred. And actually we weren't even emancipated then because we still had to wait for yep to be actually legally emancipated, right? So what we want to think about is we are the elite. This reminds me of W.E.B. Boy and Booker T. Washington. When we're saying be confident, I love that. I love that as a concept. But the children that I deal with, the young folk that I deal with that are going to career college, they don't even know anyone that's been to college. They don't know mm -hmm. anything about college. They don't even know how to fill out a financial aid application. And they're trying to get a diploma so they could probably be an LPN and make $20 an hour because that seems good to them. So I think yeah. in theory, it's really great to say be confident and command a room, but society needs to change. I'm not telling that person be confident because you can overcome discrimination because these folk that are in the boardrooms and behind those seats and like my esteemed soror, Shirley Chisholm used to say, did she did say, if you, if you don't, they don't give you a seat at the table, pull up your own chair, right? That's fine. But if you got the door locked, how am I supposed to pull up a seat at the table? <laughs> The discourse that we need to be, be proud and be confident and work twice as hard. In theory, that's true, but that's what our parents have told us to do, and that's not working. Society needs to change, and we need to push that narrative. I don't think yeah. it's fair black folk be more confident or black folk command the room. We're very special. We're like Oprah. When people tell me, oh, there's no problem. There's you. There's Oprah. There's Michael Jordan. We are Oprah, Michael Jordan, and all those people that are held up as it can happen because you guys did it. We're very special. We're the elite, yeah. elite. We need to advocate for that 20 year old in my classroom that has, doesn't have parents and his grandparents raised him and he's trying to get a diploma so he can be a paramedic. That's the person that needs a voice because we are that person's voice. How are we going to use that voice effectively to advocate for those people? Not to say be confident because I don't think be confident is the answer for that person that grew up in the east side of Fort Lauderdale and his parents were on food stamps and he barely was able to even go to college. That's not our reality, but it's a lot of the black kids that are out there right now and they're the leaders of tomorrow, not us. We're going to be the yeah. nursery eating the applesauce. That's <laughs> <laughs> but I think a good thing that Women are the most marginalized. That's yeah, clear. I think a good thing that came from that too, just to, to piggyback on it, I think a good thing that came from all of us hearing work twice as hard, be confident, the, the side good piece of that is that it kind of supercharged us to a degree that we all heard that as a kid, pull yourself by your bootstraps and all that. And it doesn't always work, but at the same time, it caught us up. Cause it's kind of like if you're running a race and they have a, a mile head start on you and you got to run a five mile race, you're going to lose probably. So I think us doing that for so long, it didn't make the change right then, but it created us where we're able to understand like, Hey, that's good theory, but you got to actually go talk to someone, you know, or stop someone from cutting someone off. 
stop them from this actually do something with it. And, and I uh, think the problem with society, Dara, not to cut you off, yeah, is the, the white, the majority are in the blocks and they're actually on the first leg of the race. We're still in the parking lot taking off our sweat. <laughs> right. so they're saying, well, what's wrong? You you had access, you, you had education, you had college. I was in the parking lot. I was pulling yeah. up to the stadium and you already took off out the I block. I just found out there's a race. I didn't know race was I, happening. I didn't even know what was going on. Nobody or, told me anything. That's what we need to consider that a lot of the folk that are marginalized are not marginalized through the fact that they didn't, they weren't confident enough or their parents didn't instill confidence in them. A lot of them are marginalized because society is marginalizing black folk in education, in healthcare, in wealth, in we don't black women martin just said it black women make 62 cents for a dollar and that's not because i'm less confident i haven't gotten a promotion i've, I've worked in education for 20 years i've got one promotion and anyone mm -hmm. that knows me and sees me i have the skills to get the job done but why am i not getting the promotion because i've been asked before but i'm just not getting it and that's mm -hmm. not because i'm not confident enough so you we need what? to think about the, the society and what society is doing in these institutions and deconstruct that and reimagine that i don't think we can do that without pressing that issue yeah go up here you got something to add to that yeah i definitely want to add to that because i think it's important what liz is saying is it's showing what we all have to deal with everyone everyone has to deal with and i believe it's very important for all of us to put a definition on certain things one what do you define yourself as two how do you define success for yourself you as an individual not me or someone else or your mom or your dad you have to define success for yourself because once you define it, then you can go out and achieve it. But if you define it based off of someone else's definition, then there's, therein lies the problem. So one of the things that we're talking about right here is talking about gifting. And I, I talk about value because value is what everyone wants. It's a what's in it for me world. So if we as a people, all people, Black people, white people, Asian people, all people. If we understand our value, then we can start to make ways into adding value to others so then we can get that higher earning potential. The way I define value, you're not going to find it in encyclopedia or Google. It's Pierre Campbell definition is your, your talents, your gifts, and your strengths. That is your value. As a human being, your value is your talents, your gifts, and your strengths. And if you bring those things, understand what they are, learn how to articulate those things to the public, if somebody doesn't value it here, you go somewhere where they value it. And then the other side is you start to become a magnet where people start to get attracted to your value. People are attracted to Liz's value outside of her job. She That's has to become president of uh, a fan or something. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, so, and that's the part that we have to really grasp as people. It's not just, oh, understanding your black giftedness. It's understanding who you are, who you, why did you come to this world? Yeah. Every single human being was brought to this world for a reason. And you were brought to solve problems. What makes you emotionally engaged? What brings you to tears? You see, this, this, this is why I like talking with y'all. Hold on, this is why I like talking with y'all. I, I try to fit this into an hour, and y'all obviously we okay. obviously went over <laughs> for everybody watching the clock. But that's okay. But I, the, the one thing I want to kind of have us wrap on real quick: we don't want to have to do these things over and over again. Like you don't see a panel of white people saying, "Let's talk about great it is to be white." Like that's not a thing because it's everywhere. It's in everything you read, the books, the TV, and everything. So for the white allies we have in the comments, thank you. We have to do this because. We haven't received this message enough, and LinkedIn quite candidly, you know, censors us sometimes. Um, Liz has dealt with this winter. Martin, and everybody kind of dealt with this to a degree. We see that our messages aren't seen as often, so that's why this happened because we need to do this. But I, I do want to challenge everybody: do something like work with a black professional. I know when I first got to Georgia, that was not a common thing. It was like you do you, I'm gonna do me. I got my Maserati, you got your this. Like there was no the two shall never meet. So all of us are in different states, areas, different things do something, actually just, you know, say, you know what, I know a black professional, we reach out to them and just talk. I'm not saying you got to throw money at them right away, but try, because we do the same things that our other counterparts do. So the reason black business has to have a focus, because it doesn't. We don't get the first shot. That's where there's so many designations to get minority owned business to get a shot. So everybody here wants you to leave a, you know, kind of supporting word, your actionable step for people to say, this has been a great live, great interaction. Let's not just end there. Leave an actionable step you think will impact 
either your business, their business, society, just however you want to take it. Ramona, I'll let you kick it off because you're the most historical one here. So you've seen this over years. So what's your actionable step for people to improve black relations in your mindset? So first, I want to speak to uh, people of African descent, African-Americans, and then uh, I'll talk to the allies, non-white, white, uh, non-African-Americans. Uh, um, in terms of African-Americans, in in the spirit of Black History and Black History Month, I would encourage everyone to use the history of our ancestors uh, and their experiences for inspiration. Uh, and there's four ways you can do that. To see the impossibilities, you, we can use their stories to see how they accomplished the impossible. And we, use, we can use those to inspire our own stories. When we look at people like Harriet Tubman, despite the dent in her hair, head that clearly identified who she was and what was even scarier, she didn't have a compass She did, and she all, always suffered for, from fainting spells. She had the nerve to go back almost 20 times to help other people. We can use Bethune Cookman as an example, uh, to see the impossibilities. When we look at, I mean, excuse me, Mary McLeod Bethune, how despite the lack of financial resources, despite the fact that she had to use charred pencils, charred coal for pencils and uh, stumps for desks, she was able to build a school. We can use a leader such as Stacey Abrams to see the impossibilities. Who would believe that a black woman could be a governor of Georgia? And so we can use their stories to inspire resilience, right? To keep pressing toward the vision. How many times did we see rebellions, insurrections, people publishing biographies and autobiographies and other forms of resistance before we saw the end of slavery? Uh, we can, how many times did we have to see schools burn down over and over and again in the South after emancipation before we finally saw the standing of historically black colleges and universities? And then the selflessness can inspire us. How many people do we know of in our histories, in our families, in our communities who went through the impossible to uh, accomplish uh, things that we could never uh, dream of? So those are the ways we can use uh, the history of our ancestors to inspire our own lives. And then for other uh, people and groups out there, non-Black people, uh, the way you can assist is by uh, using your power, your platforms, and your influence to address racism and to provide opportunities uh, for people of color. Uh, when we look at... Um, Ra ra racism is a complex system. Yep. It's complex and we have to understand the complexities. And so I would encourage everyone to read this book called White Fragility, which is an excellent book uh, on how to address your own racism. And also it helps you to see that there are some things that you think and do that you're not even conscious of. Yep. And so, uh, so Education is important. Education to our inspire our own lives and education in order that we can use our resources to help others. I love it. All right. Then you gotta follow that, man. Verona, I, know, right? wow, right. <laughs> I do want to um do something similar. I do want to speak to us and I do want to speak to our allies um in, in, in that respect. For for us, um for, guys, us take a take a breath you know <laughs> you, you are you are doing your thing you are all your ancestors wildest dreams you've done it and you're continuously doing it i don't want you to or us to always continue to feel like we have to have the pressure of of those feats right we do that every day they say how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time right mm -hmm. so you'll get, we'll get there all right um i do think obviously um structures need to be restructured <laughs> And dismantle, but in the meantime, if if we don't know if that or how quickly that may occur, learn all the rules of the game. Craft your entire life, right? There are so much that you can do to to reach your goals. I picked economics and finances because not because there aren't other areas that we could um, impact or, or or you know things like that, but I, I pick economics because. <sighs> In a, in, a, in a scenario where 
our perceptions of success may always be different, right? Then having that own and having your own intention, having your own success, having your own access, leaning into your lineage, if you don't see it in the celebrities, but definitely look at what we can see today, right? We don't always have to go back uh, so far to see excellence, but look at your lineage, lineage. It's all there. It's all in your DNA. It's all in your environment. And I guess lastly on that is don't necessarily wait for your, you know, for all the of your flowers, so to speak, before you get counseling, mental health is important. Mm -hmm. Get it along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you can be rich and be unhappy, you know, work on those things simultaneously if, if at all possible. And for our allies, um, again, yeah, be intentional. Um, you know, we all can't go backwards, but be intentional today. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. if, if the intention is there, it's for inclusion, we can see it, right? So just make that a part of your everyday practice. No one's going to hold it against you. I love it. And speaking of allies, Anthony had a good comment here. For all the white folks out there, you have to want to reach out to black professionals and not feel like it's a chore. You have to want to care. Be an empathetic human being. We are all human beings. Be human or be humane. Anthony, good activist, good, good ally. Liz, what's your actionable step for what we can do to be Black Future? I know it's Black Future Month instead of Black History, so what's something we could do actionably? <laughs> yeah, Mari loves that, that Black Future Month. I think just <laughs> stay in your lane, like somebody said in the comments, right? My whole, what I preach is look at your sphere of influence. And I think a lot of people get caught up in the idea um, I think who just said it just a second ago about eating an elephant one step one thing at a time, oh, right? Yeah. Bite at a time <laughs> so yeah, obviously all systems, we can't change everything. But I think the first step is acknowledging. I think before black folk had been taught, I'm not saying our parents were bad in doing that, but they told us get out there and work hard, work twice as hard. That's just what it is. Life is not fair. And I think I'm not going to teach my children that only because I feel as though society needs to change. And the more that we accept this trauma, the more that we accept the idea that we are just in, it's inequitable and we are just marginalized in every single area. It starts to normalize the idea that there's no responsibility for society to change. And we just have to be the ones to take responsibility for the fact that America is fucked up. And I'm just not going to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to work twice as hard. No. What happened at the Capitol? I was wrapped up in a bed like a burrito. Because I'm like, that would have been black folk. They would have took out AR 15s a moment ago. Uh, you you know, in a second, in a in second. A second. Right. So something is wrong when you have a country where it's normalized for black folk to be marginalized in every single area, especially black women. And then you have indigenous folk, and then you have Latino folk, and then you have everybody else. And then white folk are at the top of the pile. And they're like, well, we just can't find people. We just can't, we, we're trying to look for people and we just can't find them. No, you need to be, like someone said, intentional and the structure needs to change. And I do yeah. agree that we have to be positive. We have to keep a positive mind frame. And I do that every day on LinkedIn. I'm constantly saying, we are great. We are amazing. We are beautiful. We are wonderful. But at the same time, we do have to acknowledge things that need to change. And like John Lewis, my hero, John Lewis said, the Sigma man, if you see something, say something. And that's what I'm asking folk to do, whether it's black folk or those in the dominant culture, just don't accept that. I don't want the, I don't want to go back to normal. What was happening before COVID where people were just like, Shh, Oh, mass are coming. Run back to your cube. I don't want them to think we have an insurrection here or we have a riot because we can't, you know, we got to all that. I'm not doing it anymore because yeah, that's yeah. not serving us well. When you have a country that refuses to acknowledge the struggle of black folk in America, our struggle is not everybody else's struggle. Our struggle is particularly brutal because we were subjected. I came here with a visa, so I don't have a dog in a fight. I'm looking at what happened. Wrong is wrong and right is right. And if you have a group of cut the country, 13% of the country that was their descendants now were chattel. 150 years ago were property, was sold for $800 a pop. That is wrong. And that legacy is still here today. And to say, well, don't talk about that. And let's just start from today. That would ignore the civil rights movement. That would ignore the fact that black wealth, where's the, where's the, the, the credit lady? Black wealth is less than what it was during the time that Martin Luther King was alive. Martin Luther King died with a 75% disapproval rating. So we gotta acknowledge history so that we can be intentional and making sure we change history. Not for us, because we're gonna be dead and gone for our children and for our grandchildren. Take a little bit every single day, I love it. Liz said enough our peer, your actionable step for people to do something with this and not just have this be a kumbaya moment. All right, 
That is good. One thing is to continue to get educated. Remember this viewfinder? Everybody played with the viewfinder. Y'all remember back back in the eighties? I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was it was found. It was created by Charles Harrison. Charles Harrison is a black man. I wish I would have known that back then. You probably would have bought more viewfinders as a kid. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, but but little things like that. I think we just need to continue to educate educate each other, and I think it's important to empower and inspire each other. Continue to empower and inspire each other. Everybody has the, the gift of free will. So no one needs to do anything. We can encourage people, but it's like, you know what? If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. But if you educate them properly, if you make them feel comfortable, and a lot of, a lot of I think one of the reasons why I'm becoming the magnet for diversity and inclusion right now is because I understand how to make people feel comfortable in this space of uncomfortability. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about racism, when you're talking about bias, when you're talking about microaggressions and letting people understand that everybody has it. So one, educate yourself, educate you know others around you. What does that mean? There is such a thing as white privilege. It's not from the perspective that I teach a session on white privilege. It's not from the perspective that you didn't work hard to where, to get to where you are. It's from the perspective of, this is the system that's created here in the United States. And because, mm-hmm. you were, because you were born white, you have a privilege. I was born a male. I have privilege. You were born a female. <laughs> you have privilege. So, boom, understanding that is the key. Education comes from, is derived from a, a word called eduku, which means develop from within. So the educational system isn't the end all be all. We get these degrees and we put, once again, I keep talking about the value on everything outside of us, but we don't value what's inside of us. And every single one of us has value and we should continue to continue to educate ourselves, not just getting degrees and certifications, but educate yourself every day. I mean, I'm telling y'all, man, I saw that viewfinder. I was like, what? <laughs> it was by a black man? I didn't know that. So here's some another black history. I graduated from Cheney University of Pennsylvania, the first historical black university in the United States of America. You know how many people don't know that? That Cheney was the first HBCU. You know how many people? Black people? I didn't. Okay. Yeah, and you um, went there, yeah. <laughs> I went there. So what am I saying? I'm saying continue to educate yourself, continue to look at look at people and understand this. This one thing right here. I always tell people. Everybody's going through something, y'all. Every single one of you, including me, is going through something. So if we can take that perspective and we can start thinking about the world from the perspective of having compassion because that person may be going through something. The reason why they didn't pick up their phone is because maybe they went to the bathroom. They was in the bathroom or something. I don't know. They were in another meeting. You never know. Think about the fact that people got COVID right now. People have family members that lost people. Five people in one family from COVID, you know, but you're in the workforce and you're expecting these results. So if we can just help leaders to understand that everyone's going through something and same thing with our family members, you know, look, my son is in second grade and he has to deal with this virtual learning. You know, he was crying all day yesterday, y'all crying. I had to hug him for like 10 minutes. My son is crying in my arms and I had to take a step back and realize that I didn't go through this. He's mm-hmm. going through something totally different from me. His world is literally, he has, has it's like he don't have any friends. I have to think about doing something different. Yeah. So I just want to share that love with y'all. Please just know that everybody's going through something, y'all. Everybody. The people, even the people you mad at. People mad at Trump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's going through something too. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. going through something. I gotta remind myself that all the time. The mm-hmm. Queen Winter. So let, let us know yeah, something actionable. You're working with mediation with people. What's something actionable to keep the progress happening off the just conversation? You know, the legal field is predominantly white, as most fields are, but the numbers of Black people who are in positions of authority, I mean, they're dismal. And for Black women, it's even harder. And, you know, In general, women leave the workforce earlier. They leave law firms earlier. So what I would ask everyone to do is to be very intentional about working with Black folks, Black women, when you're looking for an attorney. 
we're not hard to find. We are everywhere. <laughs> there are black bar associations. You can look us up, nationalbar.org. Um, it's a group of 70,000 plus legal professionals from around the country. We're out there. You have you may have to look because we're you you may not typically befriend black folks, right? But we're there. And if you want to make the world better, make this country better, reduce the inequities, you have to be intentional. Go looking for us because mm -hmm. we are there, we are ready. Another thing that I would say, because this drives me bananas, I hear it all the time. See, I didn't curse that time, I said bananas. <laughs> <laughs> when I hear anyone, including black folks, and it really drives me nuts when I hear this from black folks, but they assume that black businesses aren't going to be as professional, that black professionals aren't as prepared. And it's absolute nonsense. Whenever I come across a black professional, I try to go out of my way to work with them, to support them, give them some extra knowledge, anything that I I have that they don't, I'm trying to share. And I, I spend a lot of my time mentoring younger lawyers and up and coming mediators. Do those things too. Lift while you while you climb. Consider, um, and I think it was was Liz who said it, but there are so many of us who haven't even seen what some of us on the panel are doing. They don't know how to do it. And as as much privilege and successes that I have had, I still am in a position where I don't, I mean, I don't know everything. I had a call with, <laughs> I had a call yesterday with the uh, incoming president of a worldwide organization for arbitrators. And she was asking me if this was something that I wanted to get into this specific area. And I said, I've never even thought about it because no one has ever mentioned it to me. I wouldn't even know how to start. And she said, that has to change. And I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure you know what the steps are and that you can find the right people to help you get there. You have to do that. It's not. This is not going to happen by accident. People are not picking themselves up by their bootstraps. Like this wasn't something I could Google. <laughs> we have to be ready to put our money where our mouths are, and share the wealth, share the knowledge, and make sure everybody has access. It looks like you, you might get hired because Rosalind says she ever has to sue me. She's going to hire you. So <laughs> Rosalind got jokes today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rosalind. All right, and Martin. So you, you you're you're def heavily in. You had Clubhouse talks going about black empowerment, black future, and everything. So you're a perfect person to end this out with. What's an actionable step um, each of us watching this and live or replay can do to kind of help make it more than a conversation? Yes. Let me just tell the chef who's in the kitchen uh, to be a little quiet because I'm gonna make these points, Miss Chef, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, shout out to my wife who's who's cooking up stuff. Uh, for her business. I think the challenge that we have um, with yesterday's or day before yesterday's announcement that Tyler Perry is now the guest um, editor for Black History Month for LinkedIn, um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, there were several Black women that could have been placed in that position, even if you wanted to place Gail King, who had to interview him about curating content for Black professionals on this platform. Uh, you know, not necessarily a man who dresses up as a woman, but definitely you could have hired black women to do that. So yeah. here's our challenge. Our challenge is that how do we deal with people who have real trauma, who have been traumatized by corporate America, traumatized by uh, the systematic racism? How do we embrace them as our brothers and sisters and keep them going while you have for lack of a better word, gaslighting <laughs> by the platform that they're on. Like basically hiring Martin Lawrence to talk about racial he health disparities saying, Martin, let's talk about medical doctors and how they're not treating black people. I mean, come on LinkedIn. 
So <laughs> the challenge that we have, and I think that we are able to do it through this platform, through what Nick has. Nick has an app called Brandpreneur. Brand Juan Brand. Young has an app called, or a platform called Melanids. Um, I'm trying to think of the sister in Portugal. She has just launched another platform called Think Forward. So the word think F W D dot com. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of another sister. They have our, our dipper dot com. We have several now about four to five platforms for black professionals. I'm not suggesting that we leave LinkedIn, but I am suggesting that we take our love and our embracing of each other to places where it's appreciated at and yep. support each other in our own platforms. By the way, Black Planet is relaunching next month. Uh -oh. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> so, but on a serious note, I think those of us that, that as Liz said, we're, we're a talented 10th, right? We have the ability, um, fortunately, most of us have the ability to see two worlds at the same time. We can see the professional world, and we know the world that our grandmother exists in, our cousin exists in, um, and we can feel both things. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's indicative of us as black folks who are professionals, who are entrepreneurs, to pour into each every one of us. And so to take time to find out, you know, I'll roll into Nick's inbox, say, yo, bro, how's it going? So what's, what's up with the app? What problems you got? Just, I'm here to, just here to listen. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, you know, here to ask a question, get anything from you. I just want you to unload on me. I think that's yeah. something that black people, we, um, I forget who was, it. oh, Liz was saying she was triggered. She's wrapped up in a blanket. I think, uh, I went through a miscarriage. A friend of mine, his father was the first person in Philadelphia to die from COVID as a bus driver. I mean, we've had some traumatic stuff that's happened in this past year. And I yep. think when we talk about white allies, we did a panel discussion on um, on Clubhouse, and we asked for our white allies to step up to the plate and to handle um, several black businesses. About 25 were actually uh, poured into, and we used to ask them to now let go of their allyship and become abolitionists. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we are. This is a radical change. It's a radical reset. And it's time for radical love. We talk about radical honesty. Let's give ourselves some radical black love. And this helps all people. I'm glad you ended that way. That helps people. That's, that's the thing that people don't recognize. If we're not all equal, not, we're not all going to be happy. So um, I love all this. Oh, go ahead, Roni. You had a piece to add? Yes. I, um, just in the spirit of Black History Month, uh, we know that uh, the uh, Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History. That's the new name, but African-American Life and History. But it started as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Uh, they're responsible for uh, creating the theme every year for Black History Month. And so I just want to uh, acknowledge the theme for this year, uh, uh, for 2021, which is the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity, so that we can make sure that in our conversation about race, about uh, um, the gift of Blackness, about community, that we also put uh, the Black family in, in at center of our discussions. I love it. Well, everybody, please be safe. Please make something out of this. Connect with the people you've seen in comments. Connect with the speakers. We have another one of these will be on the February 24th, different panel. Did two this month because why not? Black History Month, why not celebrate more? But um, please let the conversation keep on going. Everybody here is connected in some degree, been on each of their shows, part of their businesses. So do that. That's one step you can do is actually have a conversation, much to Martin's point, just ask how someone's doing or try to work with their business. We're just the same as our Caucasian counterparts. We just have a little bit of a struggle. I appreciate everybody been watching this. Um, it'll be on replay if you want to share with anybody. And thank you, YouTube. Thank you, LinkedIn. And please, please, please be safe. We will catch you guys next time on the 24th at noon. And everybody, tell Daryl congratulations, Papa, big Papa. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Thank you. My wife is watching. She got the baby in the other room. That's why I hear some noise in the background <laughs> earlier. So. My queen is, we're done though, that's it. <laughs> All right, y'all be safe.